Good afternoon. My name is Rob Schwarzwalder. I have the privilege of serving as Senior Vice President here at Family Research Council. Today it's a real joy for me to introduce our speaker, Dr. Joe Locanti. For those of you who are viewing online or will um, be recommending to friends that they view, just go to www.frc.org forward slash events. That's frc.org forward slash events. The First World War began a little more than 101 years ago. It shattered a generation, and its cost in lives and treasure remains stunning to contemplate. Yet out of the war came C.S. Lewis and J.A.R. Tolkien, two of the 20th century's greatest proponents of the importance of Christian virtue for all of culture. Unlike a generation of young writers who lost faith in the God of the Bible, Tolkien and Lewis produced epic stories infused with the themes of guilt and grace sorrow and consolation. They also simply made great stories. Giving an unabashedly Christian vision of hope in a world tortured by doubt and disillusionment, the two writers created works that changed the course of literature and shaped the faith of millions. Dr. Joe Lacanti's new book, A Hobbit, A Wardrobe, and a Great War, rediscovered faith, friendship, and heroism in the cataclysm of 1914 to 1918 is the first book to explore Tolkien and Lewis's work in light of the spiritual crisis sparked by the conflict. One of the things these men came to value was a core Christian commitment to the dignity of every person. As image bearers of God, each of us has a primary duty to him, which is the very foundation of the religious liberty which undergirds all of our other freedoms. As Lewis wrote in the Screwtape Letters, every government consists of mere men. If it adds to its commands, thus saith the Lord, it lies, and lies dangerously. Our speaker today is uniquely equipped to address these themes, and it's a pleasure to introduce him. Joe Locanti holds a Ph.D. from the King's College, University of London, and teaches history at the King's College, different King's College, in the heart of New York City. He's written thoughtfully on many of today's most pressing issues, and his commentary on religion, democracy, human rights, and international religious freedom appears in the nation's leading media outlets, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Post, the New Republic, the Weekly Standard, and National Public Radio. He's also a regular contributor to the London-based Standpoint magazine and Italy Italy's La Stampa. And I'd note personally, if you want a... Um, a good education in public policy, read Joe Lacanti. He truly is one of the most thoughtful observers of culture and the political scene writing today and commenting today. I'd close on a personal note. In Washington, D.C., it's common to refer to someone you met five minutes ago as my good friend. In the case of our speaker today, there's none of the Beltway's frequent phoniness in me saying it's a joy to now introduce my good friend of two decades, Dr. Joe Lacanti. Well, thank you, uh, Rob, uh, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, uh, Family Research Council, uh, for the invitation to come and talk to you guys. It's great to be here, great to be back to FRC. So appreciative of all the work that you guys do. Uh, let's just jump into it. The last soldier to die in the Great War was an American, Henry Gunther, a private with the American Expeditionary Force uh, in France. He was killed at 10.59 a.m., November 11th, 1918, one minute before the armistice went into effect. He was 23 years old. Gunther's squad had encountered a roadblock of German machine guns near the village of Chamon d'Avile, and against the orders of his sergeant, he charged the guns with his bayonet. German soldiers, aware of the armistice, tried to wave him off. But Gunther kept coming and was gunned down. He died instantly. His divisional record states, almost as he fell, the gunfire died away and an appalling silence prevailed. Well, despite the parties and the parades marking the end of the First World War, a brutal and appalling silence fell over much of the world. It was the stillness of souls, anguished and bewildered by the carnage of the most destructive war the world had ever seen. Historian Paul Johnson has called the conflict, quote, the primal tragedy of, the, of modern world civilization. The main reason why 
the 20th century turned into such a disastrous epic for mankind. They called it the war to make the world safe for democracy, the war to end all wars, the war to usher in the kingdom of heaven. Instead, the great war laid waste to a continent and destroyed the hopes and the lives of a generation. Before it was all over, nearly every family in Europe was grieving the loss of a family member or helping others to grieve or caring for a wounded soldier struggling to adjust to civilian life. Like no other force in history, the First World War permanently damaged the mental outlook of European society. It ushered in a season of cynicism and agnosticism toward the values and the ideals of the West. For a generation of men and women, it brought the end of innocence and the end of faith. And yet, and yet, for two extraordinary authors and friends, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, the Great War deepened their spiritual quest. Both men served as soldiers on the Western Front, survived the trenches, and used that experience to shape their Christian imagination. Tolkien creates, of course, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, one of the most influential books of the 20th century. Lewis earns fame for the Chronicles of Narnia, the series of children's books now ranked among the classics. It could be argued that these epic tales involving what? The sorrows and the triumphs of war would never have been written had these authors not been flung into the furnace of combat. Listen, listen to Winston Churchill. Battles are won by slaughter and maneuver. The greater the general, he says, the more he contributes to maneuver and the less he demands in slaughter. Well, the generals of this war demanded much in slaughter. By the time of the armistice, nearly 10 million soldiers lay dead, scores of millions wounded, many grievously. On average, on average, there were about 6,046 men killed every day of the war, every day, a war that lasted 1,566 days. Tolkien and Lewis might easily have been among their number. As a second lieutenant in the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, Tolkien spent many days and nights under fire on the Western Front. He fought at the Battle of the Somme, one of the fiercest concentrations of killing in the history of warfare. Listen to Tolkien reflecting on this. One has indeed personally to come under the shadow of war to feel full its oppression, he wrote. It now seems often forgotten that to be caught in youth by 1914 was no less hideous an experience than to be involved in 1939 and the following years. By 1918, he wrote, all but one of my close friends were dead. Also commissioned as a second lieutenant in the BEF, C.S. Lewis sent immediately to the front arriving on his 19th birthday. Any 19-year-olds out there, just out of curiosity, happy birthday on the, on, the, on the Western Front. Well, the experience of six months of trench warfare, a vortex of suffering and death, remained with Lewis throughout his life. Listen to Lewis. My memories of the last war, he said, haunted my dreams for years. And like Tolkien, he lost most of his closest friends in the conflict. By the mid-1920s, Tolkien and Lewis both arrive at Oxford University where they take up their vocations as instructors in English literature. They meet for the first time in 1926, and a bond of friendship is established that will transform their lives and their careers. Given the massive influence of their works, think about it, it's, it's hard to imagine a more consequential friendship in the 20th century. And we need to appreciate, I think, just how out of step these authors were with their times, which is part of the task of the historian. Let's get into their world. Both men write these epic tales, awash in the themes of war, sacrifice, valor, friendship, right? They create these mythic worlds torn apart by a struggle between good and evil. They use the backdrop of a global conflict as the crucible for moral and spiritual growth. Friends, these are not the kinds of stories that people are writing in the post-war years. Many veterans, war veterans, compose fiercely anti-war novels, memoirs, poetry. A large cohort of educated men and women become moral cynics. They sneer at the very idea of heroism or virtue. In the years after the conflict, the cruelty and senselessness of the war, of any war, for any reason, become the dominant themes, motifs, of a generation. Think of the works of Hemingway, 
Farewell to Arms, T.S. Eliot, The Hollow Men, Eric Ray Mark, All Quiet on the Western Front, all of these works reinforce these themes in the public mind. The watchword, friends, the watchword is disillusionment. Disillusionment, this fierce cynicism about liberal democracy, about Christianity, and the achievements of Western civilization. The shell-shocked veteran, and there are literally thousands of them wandering the streets of Europe, many of them in, in the same asylums. The shell-shocked veteran becomes a walking metaphor for much of post-war Europe. The mood is acute among the writers, the artists, the public intellectuals, but it also affects ordinary middle-class Europeans. Listen to historian Richard Overy in his book, The Twilight Years. Dismay was a mainstream concern. For the generation living after the end of the First World War, the prospect of imminent crisis, a new dark age, became a habitual way of looking at the world. Trench fever took uh, Tolkien out of the war, demobilized from the British Expeditionary Force in July of 1919, moves back to Oxford with his wife, Edith, and his infant son, John. He wins a professorship of uh, Anglo-Saxon at Oxford in 1925, which is pretty impressive for a young guy. But his early academic success cannot ease the heartache of war. Tolkien experiences, quote, a time of sorrow and mental suffering, he says. The loss of so many friends to the war produces, in the words of his children, a lifelong sadness. C.S. Lewis went into the war as an atheist, and he came out an atheist. He was an atheist in a foxhole. He wrote a war poem around that time with these lines, for all our hopes in endless ruin lie, the good is dead, let us curse God and die. That's C.S. Lewis in 1917, 1918. Wounded in combat in April 1918, Lewis is sent to a hospital bed in Bristol where he writes to his father, I could sit down and cry over the whole business, he says, nearly all of my friends in the battalion are gone. Lewis returns to Oxford, January 1919, to resume uh, his studies in the classics. And a few years later, he records in his diary this fascinating little conversation. Lewis just loved to keep a record of his early life day to day, a little journal. He writes about this conversation with a guy named the Doc. And the Doc was the uncle of a fellow soldier who himself uh, was a war veteran, I think a shell-shocked war veteran, this guy, the Doc. Well, Lewis and the Doc go for a walk one evening. And here's what Lewis writes in his journal after that. I don't know how, but we fell to talking of death and all the other horrors hanging over one. The doc said that if you stopped to think, you couldn't endure this world for an hour. I left him and walked home. Well, many post-war thinkers and writers are unwilling to endure the world in its current form, and a kind of spiritual vertigo takes hold a frantic search for solutions to the human predicament. Freudian psychology, spiritualism, scientism, socialism, these and other ideologies are attempts to solve or to explain away the horrors that seem to be hanging over the human race. By the 1920s, these ideas are gaining ground rapidly in Europe and in the United States. Listen to historian Modris Extens. A profound sense of spiritual crisis was the hallmark of that decade, 1920s he's talking. It affected laborers, landowners, industrialists, factory workers, shop clerks, urban intellectuals. Well, these facts, ladies and gentlemen, it seems to me, make the literary aims of Tolkien and Lewis all the more remarkable because they reject, they reject the moral agnosticism and the ambivalence that infects so much of the uh, output of their era. <laughs> Critics accuse them, of course, of what? Nostalgia. Nostalgia and medieval escapism, right? And it's true that these authors, you know, they wrap their tales in fantasy and in myth, but they do this in order to convey hard truths about the human condition. Yes, it's darkness, it's futility, as well as its virtues and its achievements. As Lewis explained, and man as a whole, man pitted against the universe, have we seen him at all until we see that he's like a hero in a fairy tale. Tolkien and Lewis are attracted to myth and to romance not because they seek to escape the world, but because for them the real world has a mythic and heroic quality. It's the setting for great conflicts and great quests. It creates scenes of remorseless violence, grief, and suffering, yes, as well as deep compassion, valor, and sacrifice. Let's try, let's try in our remaining time here, friends, just to unpack their vision. 
Let's unpack it. Just scratching the surface now. First, Tolkien and Lewis are utterly realistic about the corrupting influence of power. Utterly realistic about the corrupting influence of power. The desire for power. The desire to dominate others, often disguised by appeals to religion or morals. This is a recurring theme for them. Virtually no character in their stories is immune to the temptation. Think about uh, in Lewis's Prince Caspian. Nick a brick. Initially a soldier in the fight for Narnia. Turns traitor when Aslan the Great Lion fails to come to their aid when they, when they call him. Nickabrick makes the appalling suggestion that his comrades enlist the help of the White Witch. You may drop Aslan out of the reckoning, he says. We want power, and we want a power that will be on our side. In Tolkien's trilogy, we learn that Saruman, a, a wizard originally committed to helping uh, Middle-earth in the struggle against Mordor, right? Well, he's fallen under the sway of the Ring of Power. Prudence, Saruman argues. Prudence demands a temporary compromise with Sauron, the Dark Lord. We can bide our time, he says. We can keep our thoughts in our hearts, deploring maybe evils done by the way, but approving the high and ultimate purpose. Sounds a little like Washington, D.C., doesn't it? <laughs> well, here the effect of the Great War is manifest. Despite an appeal to lofty moral principles, none of the combatant nations resisted the most resisted using the most horrific weapons against the enemy, mortars, machine guns, tanks, poison gas, starvation. Listen to Churchill. When it was all over, he says, torture and cannibalism were the only two expedients that the civilized, scientific, Christian states had been able to deny themselves, he says, and these were of doubtful utility. You gotta love Churchill. And remember the social aftermath of the war. Communism, Fascism, Nazism, eugenics, these were the revolutions and the ideologies that arose in the exhaustion of the democracies in Europe, all in the name of advancing the human race. All began by promising liberation from oppression. All became instruments of totalitarian control. And Tolkien and Lewis are acutely aware of these ideologies and they react against them in their writings. They have no illusions about the corrosive influence of unchecked power, especially when it's joined to technology and science. Second, Tolkien and Lewis recover the concept of heroism in an age of moral cynicism. Heroism in an age of moral cynicism. The heroism in their stories is not defined by a single act of bravery. The hero is the product of a well-formed character. The hero emerges because of a series of choices to put the welfare of others ahead of his or her own desires. The industrialized slaughter of the First World War had damaged the very idea of choice. Think about this. The idea of choice, of moral agency, moral responsibility, free will. After all, millions of men had been flung into the ghastly machinery of a conflict that robbed them of their humanity. They were mutilated, bombed, bayoneted, gassed, incinerated, obliterated without mercy. Literary critic Roger Sale has called the First World War, quote, the single event most responsible for shaping the modern idea that heroism is dead. Well, the utter helplessness of the individual soldier on the Western Front is a recurring theme of the post-war literature. And that spirit of fatalism just extends to society at large. Here are some book titles that are on my shelf now from the 20s and 30s. Just a few titles. 1920, The End of the World. 1921, Social Decay and Degeneration. 1926, The Twilight of the White Races. 1927-28, The Decline of the West. 1931, The Problem of Decadence. 1933, my personal favorite, The Dance of Death. How about that for an FRC lecture series title? Come, The Dance of Death with Lacani. Free sandwiches. You get the point here, right, people? Tolkien and Lewis reject this mental outlook this fatalism. They insist that every person is caught up in a great moral contest and that our choices in this contest matter and they matter supremely. Remember the scene in the Chronicles of Narnia and the horse and his boy, Shasta and Aravis helped by the talking horses racing across the desert to warn Narnia of the approaching army of Rabidash? Well, before they reach their goal, they're attacked by a lion. 
Aravis further behind is moments from being cut down by this beast, and now Shasta has a choice to make. Listen to Lewis. Stop, bellowed Shasta in Bree's ear. Must go back. Must help. Shasta slipped his feet out of the stirrup, slid both his legs over the left side, hesitated for one hideous hundredth of a second, and jumped. It hurt horribly and nearly winded him, but before he knew how it hurt him, he was staggering back to help Aravis. Friends, such scenes would be very familiar to the many combatants in the Great War, the image of the soldier throwing himself into harm's way to rescue the fallen comrade. Think of the scene in The Lord of the Rings when the hobbits encounter Lady Galadriel, the mightiest of all the elves in Middle-earth, as they gather before her, and she fixes her eyes on each of them and delivers the warning. Your quest stands upon the edge of a knife. Stray but a little, and it will fail to the ruin of all. Well, what are they to do? Each of them is faced with the appalling clarity of the choice laid before them to continue in the quest into certain danger and deprivation or take the safe and easy way and turn back. Listen to Tolkien. All of them, it seemed, had fed alike. Each had felt that he was offered a choice, a choice between a shadow full of fear that, he great, that, that lay ahead and something that he greatly desired. Clear before his mind it lay, and to get it, he had only to turn aside from the road and leave the quest and the war against Sauron to others. Well, this bedrock belief in the responsibility to resist evil, the responsibility to resist evil gives the writings of Tolkien and Lewis their dignity and their power. It's the reason, I think, that their stories so fantastical in style seem to speak into our present reality, because the war against evil is the moral landscape of our mortal lives, isn't it? Whatever form it takes, this evil, whatever form it takes in our world, we are called to resist it, as so many of you are doing here at this organization. By insisting on our responsibility to confront evil, Tolkien and Lewis retrieve the medieval concept of the heroic quest. The heroic quest. Think about Beowulf or the death of Arthur, and they reinvent that for the modern mind. In an era that exalts cynicism and irony, Tolkien and Lewis seek to reclaim this older tradition of the epic hero. Now, why? That's the question the historian likes to ask. Why? Why, ignoring the most powerful trends of their culture, do these men embark on this task? It's not going to lead to career advancement. Not at Oxford. Well, part of the answer, I think, and I have only a partial answer, Part of the answer, I think, lies in the battlefields of France. It was there, as young soldiers, that they encountered these virtues in the officers and the privates and the medics at the Western Front. It was there, according to Tolkien, that the inspiration for his most beloved mythic character occurred. Where did Tolkien get his idea for The Hobbit in the first place? Well, after he became professor at Oxford, while he was sitting and grading student papers, and if anyone's ever worked as a teacher, I'm a professor now, so I, I understand this emotion. You get, you get a little weird grading papers after a while. Tolkien's getting a little weird grading papers. Finds a blank sheet of paper. Relieved by it, just starts daydreaming and scrawls on the blank sheet, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. He didn't even know why he wrote those words. Later on, reflecting, he goes, he says, eventually I thought I'd better find out what hobbits are like. Well, we now know what hobbits are like. From his own account, the character of the hobbit is a reflection of the ordinary soldier, steadfast in his duties while suffering in that dreary hole in the ground, the frontline trench. Many of the members of the British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, were citizen soldiers of the volunteer army up until 1916, drawn from the working classes. Even during the most intensive campaigns along the Western Front, the British Army showed a remarkable resilience, according to historians, relative to other armies. They didn't break and run. There wasn't a breakdown in morale. One of the most beloved heroic figures in modern literature is based on Tolkien's firsthand knowledge of the virtues of the men in the trenches in the Great War. Listen to Tolkien on this, reflecting on it in some letters. I've always been impressed that we are here, surviving, because of the indomitable courage of quite small people against impossible odds. The hobbits were made small, he explained, to show up 
in creatures of very small physical power the amazing and unexpected heroism of ordinary men at a pinch. And then he goes on, my Sam Gamgee is indeed a reflection of the English soldier, of the privates I knew in the 1914 war and recognized as so far superior to myself. There you have it. Well, the same could be said of any number of characters in Lewis's stories for children. Often it's the humblest or the smallest, like a mouse called Reapy Chief, who displays the greatest valor on the battlefield, right? As soldiers, Tolkien and Lewis lived among these quite small people, witnessed their courage under fire, joke with them, mourn with them, and watch them die. As veterans of the most destructive war the world had ever seen, they cannot glorify its violence and anguish, and they don't. But neither can they accept the fatalism and the cynicism that has become so prevalent. Wilfred Owen's raging anthem against war, the shrill, demented choirs of wailing shells cannot be the last word for them. And so we have the concept of heroism, reinvigorated and reinterpreted for the modern mind. Third, Tolkien and Lewis uphold the importance of friendship in our common struggle against evil. Friendship in the struggle against evil. For Tolkien and Lewis, their personal knowledge of the fellowship of men under fire, think about it. This must rank as another defining experience for their literary lives. Lewis first established friendships like these with his brother Warney, also a soldier in the British Expeditionary Force, his older brother, whom he called his dearest and closest friend, who understood the anxieties of combat. And with a guy named Lawrence Johnson, Lawrence Johnson, who fought alongside Lewis on the Western Front and shared his love of literature and philosophy. Reflecting years later, Lewis described, uh, declared that Johnson, this guy Johnson, quote, would have been a lifelong friend if he'd not been killed. He was moving toward theism. He wasn't even a Christian. He was moving toward theism, and we had endless arguments on that and every other topic whenever we were out of the line. You get the picture? Johnson and Lewis are arguing theology. Uh, every time a, a, a shell comes over, you know, they duck, they argue more theology when there's a break in the firing, just like Lewis. Well, the theme of friendship pulses through each of the Narnia stories, doesn't it? It's like a force of nature. It might even be said that friendship replaces romance as the preeminent expression of love in Lewis's stories. It flourishes among the children, between the children and the noble Narnians, and between Aslan and all who serve him in love and obedience. Listen to Lewis reflecting, I think, on the experience of war to explain what distinguishes the love among friends from all other kinds of loves. Here's what he says. One knows nobody so well as one's fellow. Every step of the common journey tests his mettle. And the tests are tests we fully understand because we're undergoing them ourselves. You will not find the warrior, he says. You will not find the warrior, the poet, the philosopher, or the Christian by staring into his eyes as if, as if he were your mistress. Better to fight beside him, read with him, argue with him, pray with him. It's the same for Tolkien, who was devoted to his inner circle of friends at the King Edward School in Birmingham, his band of brothers. In 1916, they held their own war meeting in London. They called it the Council of London, expecting to be sent into the theater of war at any moment. And at that meeting, we don't know everything they said, but they shared their deepest hopes and dreams for the future. Is it a coincidence, ladies and gentlemen, is it a coincidence that the concept of friendship amid the suffering of war is one of the great themes of the Lord of the Rings? Frodo, joined in his quest by his friends from the Shire, Sam, Merry, Pippin, and of course, Aragorn, the ranger of the north, Legolas of the elves, Gimli from the dwarves, and of course, Gandalf the Grey. They are the fellowship of the ring, right? The fellowship of the ring. When Frodo arrives at Crick Hollow, before setting out into the old forest, he's determined to leave on his own. Remember the scene? He doesn't want to expose his companions to the perils that lie ahead. But Merry, Pippin, and Sam, they get wise to his plans, and they confront him before he can slip away. They insist on coming with him. Frodo protests, but it doesn't seem I can trust anyone. Merry is unflappable. It all depends on what you want, Frodo. You can trust us to stick to you through thick and thin, to the bitter end. And you can trust us to keep any secret of yours closer than you keep it yourself. But you cannot trust us to let you face trouble alone. 
and go off without a word. We're your friends, Frodo. We know a good deal about the ring. We are horribly afraid, but we're coming with you or following you like hounds. Well, there's a question for us, isn't it? Do we have a few men and women in our lives, a few friends who are following us like hounds, do we? We need them. We do, I do. Well, this bond of friendship between Sam and Gamgee and Frodo Baggins, I think, is one of the moral triumphs of the work. Remember when they're at the threshold of Mount Doom, near the very end of their quest? They're weak from thirst and exhaustion. They're nearly overwhelmed by the desolation of the landscape, the lack of another living thing, the black skies, the noxious fumes, the ash and the slag and the burned stone, and the smell of death. It's a scene not unlike what Tolkien experienced at the Battle of the Somme. They stagger toward their goal. Frodo, weakened by that great burden of carrying the ring, begins to crawl on his hands. Listen to Tolkien. Sam looked at him and wept in his heart, but no tears came to his dry and stinging eyes. I said I'd carry him. If it broke my back, he muttered, and I will. Come, Mr. Frodo, he cried. I can't carry it for you, but I can carry you and it as well. So up you get. Come on, Mr. Frodo, dear. Sam will give you a ride. Just tell him where to go, and he'll go. I suspect, ladies and gentlemen, that only individuals who knew friendship of this kind, who experienced it in a field of combat, could write passages of such grit and courage and nobility. Well, after the war, Tolkien and Lewis, they seek to recapture something like that intense comradeship that sustained them during the crisis years of 1914-1918. So at Oxford, they launched the Inklings. Those who dabble in ink, the inklings, the group of friends and fellow scholars who meet weekly to read and to discuss their work over a pint or two or three. Well, Tolkien helps Lewis to find a publisher for his first science fiction novel, Out of the Silent Planet, 1938. More importantly, though, it's Tolkien's conversation with Lewis. Tolkien is a committed Catholic. Tolkien's conversation with Lewis, while he's still an agnostic, on the night of September 19th, 1931, they talk until 2 in the morning about the nature of myths and about Christianity as the true myth, the myth that became fact. It was that conversation that Lewis described later as the immediate human cause of his conversion to Christianity through a friend. Well, for his part, Lewis becomes for Tolkien his great advocate for pursuing his hobbitry, as they called it. As Tolkien described that Lewis's gift was his, quote, sheer encouragement over many years to keep on. Listen to Tolkien. He, Lewis, was for long my only audience. Only from him did I ever get the idea that my stuff could be more than a private hobby. But for his interest and unceasing eagerness for more, I should never have brought the Lord of the Rings to a conclusion. What do you make of that? Well, when Lewis learns that the Lord of the Rings has been accepted for publication, he writes a letter to Tolkien describing his, quote, sheer pleasure of looking forward to having the book uh, to read and to reread. And then he reveals the importance of the book to both their lives. And when I found this letter in the Lewis collection, I'd not seen it quoted anywhere else in any of the books I'd seen. And I just thought, this is gold. This is what, that's the hair on the back of your neck just standing up. You feel like you found something valuable about these men that tells you so much. This is what Lewis wrote the token to describe the impact of the, of the book. He says, so much of your whole life, so much of our joint life, so much of the war, so much that seemed to be slipping away into the past is now in a sort made permanent. Do you catch what he's saying? Somehow Tolkien in this trilogy has captured something of the essence of their lives together. So here is a glimpse of what friendship can look like when it reaches for a high purpose and is watered by the streams of sacrifice and loyalty and love. All of this, I think, is part of their achievement, but they accomplish something else, too. We can't overstate how profoundly subversive and countercultural the works of Tolkien and Lewis were in their own day and remain so in our day. And I know when I use that word uh, subversive and countercultural, I see Rob Swalls with that, just his ears are perking up. That's, that's his bread and butter to be the subversive. Well, the soldiers of the first war, think about it. They lived through endless days of mud, stench, slaughter, and death. Nothing like it had ever occurred in the history of the world. It shook the foundations of civilized life. Listen to Churchill again. All the horrors of all the ages were brought together 
and not only armies, but whole populations were thrust into the midst of them. T.S. Eliot saw the post-war world as a wasteland of human weariness. I think we're in Rat's Alley, he wrote, where the dead men lost their bones. Well, after returning home from this war, Tolkien and Lewis might easily have joined the ranks of the rootless and the disbelieving. Instead, instead, they faced the problem of war and suffering with realism, but not with resignation. For them, there is no shortcut to the land of peace. There is no primrose path to the mansions of the blessed. First come tears and suffering in Mordor, heartless violence at Stable Hill, and yes, horror and death at Golgotha. Their stories insist that we live in a moral universe, that war is a symptom. It is a symptom of the ruin and the wreckage of human life, but it can inspire noble sacrifice for humane purposes. War would sometimes be necessary to preserve human freedom. Remember the words of Faramir, captain of Gondor and Lord of the Rings? War must be, he says, while we defend our lives against a destroyer who would devour all. But I do not love the bright sword for its sharpness, nor the arrow for its swiftness, nor the warrior for his glory. I love only that which they defend. While these two giants of literature created these mythic and heroic figures who nevertheless make a claim upon our ordinary concrete lives, don't they? They challenge us to join them in this great struggle against the dark forces of this world. And it's a desperate struggle, I know. It feels desperate. And this leads us to the most surprising element of their achievement as we begin to wrap up here. In the worlds created by Tolkien and Lewis, their struggle against evil is possible only because there's a source of grace and goodness outside of themselves, a source of grace and goodness outside of themselves. For all the accusations of medieval escapism, Tolkien and Lewis come closer to capturing the tragedy of the human condition than any postmodern cynic. By the end of his quest, think about it, by the end of his quest, Frodo the ring bearer has given up the thought of ultimate success or even survival. Hope fails, an end comes, he tells Sam. We have only a little time to wait now. We're lost in ruin and downfall, and there's no escape. At the climax of his journey, at the fires of Mount Doom, despite all of his courage and strength, Frodo fails in his quest. He fails. He chooses not to destroy the ring, but instead succumbs to its power and places it once again on his finger. I do not choose now to do what I came to do. The ring is mine. Tolkien explained that scene this way. But one must face the fact, he said, the power of evil in the world is not finally resistible by incarnate creatures, however good they may be. Here is where Tolkien and Lewis depart most radically from the spirit of our age. Our modern tales of virtue, heroism, the gallery of superheroes, super cops, super spies, super zombies, they offer a protagonist who invariably saves the day by his or her what? Natural intelligence? Strength of will, good looks, usually with lots of firepower at hand, right? Second Amendment, baby. Lock and load. I, I believe in the Second Amendment. Don't, don't panic there, man. <laughs> Rob, Rob's, oh, he's, just, he's fulminating in the mouth over there. I believe in the Second Amendment. Relax. Uh, the moral vision of Tolkien and Lewis is a little bit different, isn't it? It's fundamentally different. The hero cannot, by his own efforts, prevail in the struggle against evil. He can't. The forces arrayed against him, as well as the weakness within make victory impossible. The tragic nature of his quest begins to dawn on him to oppress him until the moment when a final failure seems inevitable. And now, the mythic dimension of their stories reaches its zenith. Like the best fairy tales, they provide the consolation of the happy ending, what Tolkien called the sudden joyous turn toward rescue and redemption. It's the reversal of a catastrophe what Tolkien calls the EU catastrophe, EU catastrophe, a decisive act of grace which promises to overcome our guilt, restore what's been lost, and set things right. Frodo's defeat, which is really our defeat, it's overturned by a power stronger than our weakness. Tolkien identifies this power as, quote, that one ever-present person, capital P, who is never absent and never named. And so it is the Gollum driven by his lust to dominate, bites off Frodo's finger that bears the ring only to slip and plunge to his death, right, into the fire. The ring is destroyed, 
not by Frodo, <laughs> not by the fellowship, but by a sudden and miraculous grace. In Lewis's children's stories, the crowning moment of grace occurs, of course, in the last battle. Spoiler alert, okay? All right, all right. King Tyrion and the children and a faithful remnant of Narnians find their way to the entrance of the stable, right? The last battle of the last king of Narnia. And we are led to believe that inside the stable is certain death, the stronghold of an all-powerful evil. I feel in my bones, says Pagan, that we shall all, one by one, pass through that dark door before morning. I can think of a hundred deaths. I would rather have died. Well, as the company is forced inside its doors, all hope seems lost. Here again comes the joyous turn, because the great lion has invaded the stable. He's cast out the demon Tash. He's turned the stable into a portal into Aslan's country. And so the children watch now as Narnia is destroyed, but a new world, nearly more beautiful than their hearts can bear, is called into being. All the old Narnia that mattered, Lewis writes, all the dear creatures have been drawn into the real Narnia through the door. And the character of Lucy. Lucy, she captures the simple yet powerful symbolism of the stable, doesn't she? In the gospel accounts, it's the birthplace of the Messiah the lion of the tribe of Judah, of Jesus in Bethlehem. In our world too, Lucy says, a stable once had something inside it that was bigger than our whole world. Well, these epic tales of rescue and sacrifice, they're strangely familiar to us, aren't they? Because we've heard them or rumors of them before. For these two giants of literature, there is only one truth one singular event that could end the long war against evil, undo the tragedy of the human condition, and bring lasting peace. The return of the king. The return of the king. In Narnia, the king, of course, is Aslan, the great lion. Only Aslan knows the way to that blessed realm that lies beyond the sea. The light ahead was growing stronger, writes Lewis in the last battle. Lucy saw that a great series of many-colored cliffs led up in front of them like a giant staircase, and then she forgot everything else, because Aslan himself was coming, leaping down from cliff to cliff like a living cataract of power and beauty. This king comes in power and beauty as the voice of conscience and the source of consolation, as the lion and the lamb. Here is the union of tenderness and severity, as Lewis put it, of terror and comfort intertwined. In Tolkien's story, the king is Aragorn, the chief epic hero of the Lord of the Rings. Aragorn, heir to the kingship of Gondor, his life is devoted to the war against Sauron. His true stature, though, is made known only after Sauron's defeat when he finally assumes his throne. Listen to Tolkien. But when Aragorn arose, all that beheld him gazed him in silence, for it seemed to them that he was revealed to them for the first time. Tall as the sea kings of old, he stood above all that were near. Ancient of days he seemed, and yet in the flower of manhood. And wisdom sat upon his brow, and strength and healing were in his hands, and a light was about him, and then Faramir cried, Behold the king. Well, here's a vision of human life that is at once terrifying, and sublime. Here is a world, our world, in which every soul is caught up in an epic struggle against evil, a story of sacrifice and courage and clashing armies, the return of the king. This is the day, ladies and gentlemen, when every heart will be laid bare, the day when we will know, we will know, with inexpressible joy or with unspeakable sorrow, whether we've chosen light or darkness. It is in these imaginative works of fiction, these mythic tales of heroism, sacrifice, and redemption that we find a clue to the meaning of our earthly journey. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Asks Sam. For the creators of Narnia and Middle Earth, this is the deepest source of hope for the human story, the belief that God and goodness are the ultimate realities and that the shadow of sin and suffering will finally and forever be lifted from our lives. The great war will be won, and this king who brings strength and healing in his hands will make everything sad come untrue. Thank you for listening.
Well, I think we've got a little time for questions. I went a little longer than I planned. I apologize for that, but uh, happy to take any questions. Now, the, dan the danger with me writing this book on uh, Tolkien, Lewis, and the First World War is I'm not uh, a literary guy, professor of literature. I'm not an expert on Tolkien and Lewis, and I'm not a war historian, so I'm not really an expert on the First World War. So Rob's thinking, why'd you write the book, Lakani? <laughs> Because I felt like somebody needed to kind of take a crack at this to look at the experience of war, which was so catastrophic, the First World War, for every man who served in that uh, battle. It affected him in a permanent way, every man in some way. And it seemed to me that weren't, there weren't enough biographers out there paying much attention to the impact of the war, the possible impact of the war on their literary imagination. And so, you know, that's just what we're trying to do. I've got I to plug the book. Uh, that's what we have to try to do uh, uh, in this book here, uh, try to unpack how that war might have affected their literary imagination. That's, that's the idea. So, questions? Al Milliken, uh, AM Media. Had you read any of their uh, literature as a boy, or when did, you, have you, when did you first read their books? And, and then I was also curious yeah. about um, when you went into the project, uh, did it change much? I mean, the idea you came up with, is that pretty much you had right from the start, or did you change your thinking along the way? Great questions, Al. Thank you for those. Real quickly, uh, you know, I came to the books much later in life. Um, I'm a late bloomer. Rob knows this. <laughs> to which Rob replies, Lacan, do you call this blooming? <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are. Uh, I started reading Tolkien's Lord of the Rings when I was doing my doctoral work, you know, six, seven years ago over there in London, and I was studying John Locke during the day, you know, nine, ten hours a day of John Locke, and then by about eight o'clock or nine o'clock, I would start reading the Lord of the Rings in a little pub with a, with a pint or two, and that was my escape, and it was so morally invig invigorating. I'm so glad I came to it later in life. Uh, similarly for Lewis, came to it later. Uh, but the question, Al, tell me again now about, oh, how I started out and, and uh, did I kind of go where I thought I would go. The great thing about writing a book is you have an idea in your head. You think there are these connections, but you don't know how it's going to play out. So until I started really poring over their works in a serious way, and then looking at the literature of the 1920s, I was just surprised by what I'd found. I think I, one of the big surprises was how much they were fighting against the grain, just standing against the tide. Every, every tired cliche I can think of. I mean, these guys were completely out of step with their times in the 1920s and 30s. And I think the more I got into the research and the writing, that really surprised me, and it gave me a deeper appreciation for their achievement. We tend to think, yeah, they're writers, they're at Oxford, they got all this, all this kind of uh, support. Uh, the college is there right behind them. People are writing all kinds of lovely fiction. And, 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 no, they're not. And to write the kind of things they were writing was frowned upon at Oxford. You're supposed to be focusing on your academic work, publishing academic tone, tomes in your field. So to write what they wrote was all on their own time, when they're feeling probably pretty tired when they're on their third or fourth cup of coffee, or tea, such as it is. You know, most of the good things in this world I've, I've heard are done by tired people. They must have been pretty tired, uh, but they were devoted to this, to this sense of calling, I think. And I, I, my appreciation for the accomplishment, it, it deepened because of that work and understanding the period right after the war, the great disillusionment. Great questions, Al, thank you for those. In the back there, yeah. Yeah, um, so I'm wondering if you thought, um were, were Lewis and Tolkien vindicated by later developments, the 30s, World War II, uh, <clears throat> by the, you know, their opponents uh, coming out of World War I, did, were they vindicated by later years? And um, also with that, um, <clears throat> what lessons is, do you feel like you uncovered for how you're framing and putting the issues in context today that we're dealing with in light of this research? So there, I guess those are two kind of questions there. Yeah. Let, me, let me take that first one first and remind me the second one. And tell me your name, I'm sorry. I'm Travis. I'm here with that person. Thank you, Travis. When you say vindicated, Travis, vindicated in what sense? What do you mean? Let's well, be more specific. So they were fighting against the grain, against these disillusionment writers uh, coming out of the war. Out of the World War One era, they were, you know, they, they were fighting against the grain, against all these guys who were who were proclaiming disillusionment. Yeah. Did the view of the culture towards them change with the developments in the '30s and World War Two and, and subsequent developments? Let me see if I can take a shot at that. It's a great question, uh, if I understand. Let me take a shot at it. You know, their appreciation for the danger of unchecked power is completely vindicated. And that's part of the reason that there's such an enduring appeal, I think, of their works. Evil unchecked is a huge problem. And, and when Tolkien's uh, trilogy is finally published in the early 1950s, people assume that the work is a kind of a metaphor for the atomic weapon, that the ring is a metaphor for the atomic bomb. Immense power, you know, too, too dangerous to use, too dangerous not to use, that kind of thing. Token sets them straight in the letter and says, of course it's not a metaphor for atomic power, but a power used to dominate. 
power. That's one of the lessons these guys learned, I think, in witnessing not only the war, First World War, but then the 1920s, the 1930s, the rise of fascism and communism, these deeply godless ideologies. Uh, and so they have no illusions about what happens when you give power to people, especially joining it to technology. They're very, they're not anti-science, but they're very, very dubious and skeptical about the ways in which science and technology are being used. Think about it. These guys experienced technology in the trenches of the First World War in a way no soldiers ever had. The long-range mortars, why do they do trench war warfare in the first place? Because you can't just cross a, uh, a field now in your, with your cavalry charge because mortars are coming like from a mile away destroying your army. So now you're going to hunker down and build trenches and now it's just going to be a war of att attrition. Lobbing bombs back and forth across trenches, wait for a lull, hopefully you've decimated the enemy and then try to cross and, and, uh, and seize territory. So they experienced that technology firsthand and it made them very sober about the use of technology in the service of power. So that was, uh, trying to ask the first part of that question, certainly vindicated on that front. Second one, I'm sorry? Short Second one was, as you uh, dug into this and, and wrote the book and researched for it, how did your own uh, personal view of events today change, and did you have a, a new uh, framework in your mind, and a new way of contextualizing oh, current events and dealing with the social issues and the opposition that we deal with? Great question. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sorry for my, my fading memory here. Um, you know, one of the great lessons of these two men, uh, it's just for all of us, I think for all of us, is they were devoted to their craft. They were devoted to excellence in their craft. And their craft was uh, to this creative imagination. And they deliberately set out to write stories that would challenge the prevailing mood and reintroduce into the public mind these ideas of virtue, valor, sacrifice for a noble cause. And they, that's part, part of the reason they formed the Inklings, was so that they could help each other to become the best writers they could be. That is a commitment to craft and a commitment to excellence as Christian men. That is a great lesson for all of us. So whatever your sense of giftedness is, it seems to me it's going to need cultivation. You want to bring some people alongside, and you've got to pursue that sense of calling and giftedness in, in the way you best think you can, in your sphere. These guys didn't enter politics. They did what they could do. They never imagined their works would be uh, what they became in terms of their influence and their power. So that, to me, was one of the great, deeply encouraging lessons from these guys. Despite all the pressures and responsibilities, despite the cultural mood, they're going to pursue their calling, their task, with excellence. They're, and I think the Inklings met for 16 years, and I don't think they hardly missed a week. Every week, right through the Second World War. You know, from the 1930s right through the Second World War into the 1950s, these guys are still meeting. 16, over a period of 16 years. There's a, there's a letter from uh, Tolkien. He writes to his son Christopher, it's during World War II, and he says, uh, the Inklings have taken a vote and decided that if we survive this war, we're gonna, go f we're gonna rent out an inn in the English countryside, and, and basically, this is paraphrased, but pretty close, and, and drown ourselves in nothing but beer and talk without a clock. <laughs> so, you know, this fellowship, this commitment of men uh, to their craft was so powerful and strong and helped all of them to be better writers, I'm per absolutely persuaded, and have the influence they have. It's touching the surface of it, yeah. Mal Klein, Accuracy in Academia. Uh, silly question. Did the lectures that C.S. Lewis gave on the BBC during World War II that became mere Christianity in turn grow out of his World War I experience and his talks with Tolkien? That is a terrific question. And I don't really have a good answer for it because I haven't, I haven't uh, really uh, poured over that period of his life, the Second World War. I was focused on the First World War. How did the First World War perhaps influence those broadcasts? Well, we, we do have to say, obviously, that the Second World War, the imminence of it, that London's being bombed, Britain's being bombed, that, of course, is the, how the Chronicle of Narnia starts out, right? Children being sent out of London. So the urgency, I think the urgency and the sense of what? Living on the edge again, now that war is on. And we know this from their letters, especially from Lewis's letters, but also Tolkien's. The Second World War is now bringing back the memories of the First. And there's a lot of conversation. If you look at the correspondence, uh, when Tolkien is writing to his son, both of his sons who are serving in the British uh, Expeditionary Force or the, or the RAF, he's going back to his own war experience. Lewis is frequently referring back to the First World War during those uh, Second World War years. So, you know, in their minds, here, here, here we go again. Here is human nature at its worst, the tragedy of human nature. War is a symptom of the tragedy of human nature. So uh, you know, how did the, the experience of the First World War 
uh, influence some of the writing of the Chronicles of Narnia? You know, I think there are scenes, for example, uh, one little scene comes to my mind, um, Reapy Cheap, when uh, his tail is cut off, right? And it's just a stump, and it's bandaged up, right, little Reapy Cheap? You know, one of the most poignant images in the First World War were the amputee soldiers bandaged up, just hobbling along. I can't swear, but it sure looks to me like that is just pulled right out of his own experience. He would have seen those men. He would have been fighting alongside some of them. So I think there are re literally images taken from the First World War that Lewis injects into the Chronicles of Narnia to give it the sense of realism. Remember, he's writing for children, so he's not going to be as graphic as Tolkien's going to be. But both of those men are drawing in their works, and I try to trace it out uh, in the book. Where do I think, perhaps, the experience of war from World War I literally works its way into their writings? Great question. Great. So far. Others? We've got a little time. Mind or two? We've got time for one, two more? Joe, as we think about the First World War, the images are so horrific and so um, beyond really imagining. As Lewis moved into his Christian faith, it took him a long time. I mean, it was yes. roughly 13, 14 years yes. after the First World War. Can you comment on just briefly the spiritual development that led him ultimately to yeah. his faith? Thank you for that question, Rob. It's a terrific question. That was also one of the great discoveries I'd read a couple of Lewis bio, uh, you know, biographers who get at some of this, but I think because some of the biographers, you know, I'm an historian, not a literary guy, not a, not a, a, a theologian, so I'm, I try to be attentive to the context, the immediate context. It is not a coincidence that Lewis picks up George MacDonald, um, the book Fantasties, uh, in 1916, before he's drafted, with all the pressures and the, and the anxiety about war, and George MacDonald, as this Christian author, when Lewis finishes that book, he writes uh, later on, he says, after I'd finished it, I knew I'd crossed a great frontier. What, what George MacDonald did for Lewis, he says, was to baptize his imagination. He helped him to learn to love goodness. He didn't convict his conscience at that point. That came later, he says, with other through other friends. But it's not a coincidence. I am absolutely persuaded that people like MacDonald were effective on Lewis's spiritual journey because of the crucible of war. And Lewis went on, he wrote in the 1920s. He, you know, he started reading the book in 1916, he read Fantasties, but he kept reading Fantasties. He says in the 1920s, that book has become a kind of devotional book for me. Literally his phrase in the 1920s, when he's, an, when he's still an atheist, agnostic, a devotional book, George MacDonald. So that's part of the journey. Lawrence Johnson is part of this journey for him, this guy. He was so impressed, the thing he says about Lawrence Johnson the thing about this guy was uh, he was a man of integrity. He was a man of utmost moral integrity, even though he wasn't a Christian. And he, had, he shared Lewis's love of literature. He probably was about on Lewis's level intellectually. So he couldn't just dismiss him. And he found himself astonished, because what he says is, uh, at that point in his life, when he met Johnson at 19, he was morally a reprobate. He was engaging in all kinds of things he's too modest to discuss. And here he meets this man who's intellectually his peer, who is, who's obedient to what Lewis called the moral law. The moral law. And it just jarred him. It jarred him. And it made him think there might be something about these severer virtues, Christian virtues, that maybe I need to think about. And you can see how God is working in his, in his mind throughout those years. Unfortunately, we do have a lot of his letters and recollections. You begin to see, over time, the numerous people uh, friends, authors, and there's one line that Lewis, Lewis uses in his uh, autobiography, Surprised by Joy, uh, where he says, I found suddenly that all of my best friends had joined the other side. <laughs> They'd all become Christians. All of my good friends had joined the other side. And he just, at the end of the day, and then that conversation with Tolkien was so uh, pivotal and transformative for him. Because think about this whole, one more point on this, if I could, quickly, on the, on the whole myth thing. Lewis, in 1931, with this conversation, like most academics, believes that Christianity is just another myth, meaning no truth in it, complete falsehood. The myth of the God who dies and maybe to some resurrection thing, just like the Greeks and the Romans with their dying gods, corn gods, and all the rest of it. That's how he looks at Christianity. And Tolkien begins to explain what you love about these ancient myths, Lewis, the idea of sacrifice, <clears throat> redemption, atonement, those qualities 
Myths come not just from man's imagination, they come from God. And there is a great myth, a true myth, the Christian myth that became fact. All these other myths are intimations of the great myth. They're hints and shadows, derivations. They're glimmers of light, but the true light is the Christian story, which is not a myth as you think of this, it's the myth that became fact. And that is a transformative conversation for him till two in the morning, and he writes about that uh, immediately afterwards, des describing how transformative it is. So it, it is a, it's a journey for him by the grace of God. Great question. Thanks for that. Yeah. Good place to close? Good place. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for coming on a beautiful day. Thank you so much.